Welcome, welcome, welcome to Above Replacement Radio. I am your host, Chris Gianta. I might be becoming a bad baseball fan who can't enjoy the romantic things because of advanced statistics. 15 years from now, I want to be on the early baseball committee. Over there on the other side of the screen is Daniel Curran. I literally have the fan graphs hoodie. The baseball reference t-shirt is repping some stats, you know what I'm saying? It's not necessarily Hall of Fame. It's not necessarily above average, but we can guarantee you we are better than just the standard replacement level college sophomore. And welcome to Above Replacement Radio, where we're talking baseball. Kind of whenever I'm your host, Chris Gianta, over there on the other side of the screen is Daniel Curran. How you doing, Daniel? Chris, I'm doing all right. It's uh, We're back to the old background now. I am off Cape officially. Uh, the internship has ended. The Born Braves, have they ran it back. Uh, but you know, I get to, I get to go fully back into major league baseball, which I'm super excited about. I've missed it. Uh, so we've got a lot to talk about today. Yeah. Shout out to Jared Saltolamacchia leading the way for the born Braves, by the way. Absolutely. Um, fun. Never, never but, lost in a playoff series. Yeah, no, never, never, never. Um, six and oh. So, so yeah, as we, as we get back into, uh, MLB mode, uh, it's it's the season has been the season is kind of in an exciting time right now. A lot of good playoff races and some are affected by different things happening with rosters. And that is that has really been exemplified by the Rays. And we're going to talk about specifically one of those unfortunate transactions. The other, uh, you know, just to acknowledge, just to just to know that we just to have it known that we know, you know, Wander Franco is currently on the restricted list. Uh, with an ongoing investigation uh, of, you know, what allegedly would be some pretty bad stuff, but because there are so many details to be um, collected that aren't collected yet, uh, we're not really going to get into it. And, you know, I think it's kind of obvious if the allegations are true that it's a really, really, really bad thing. Um, But, you know, it's no need to really analyze it right now because it's an ongoing investigation. But, you know, it is it is a pretty big blow to the Rays roster to look at it, you know, in a in a baseball sense. But another big blow to the Rays roster is Shane McClanahan going down with an elbow injury and having Tommy John surgery. Um, it just it really just keeps happening. And it's it's very cliche at this point. Yeah, no, it's I don't know if this has been a large concern of this podcast's going back to like at least 2021 uh where you know the rays they're very good at developing players especially pitchers but uh for whatever reason all of them get specifically long term injuries i mean tommy john surgery most specifically if you look chris i know you t- you tweeted a list of every rays pitcher that's gotten tommy john since 2021 uh and you can add shane mcclanahan to that list so He's out for the rest of this year, very likely out until 2024 as well, um, or for all of 2024. And that, it, you know, that goes along with Shane Boz, who got Tommy John, uh, Drew Rasmussen, who got an elbow surgery similar to Tommy John, but not exactly that. Jeffrey Springs, who got Tommy John this year. All of their starting pitchers this year, four of the guys, four out of the five guys that they anticipated would be a part of their five-man rotation for the majority of this year, uh, got Tommy John surgery this year, which is extremely concerning like there has to be some I don't know like there should be a separate investigation that it opens up here because something's going on here like no other organization has this uh except for the Rays and it's an every year thing that we're talking about something like this you look back to 2021 which was another really bad year where a lot of their relievers very specifically got Tommy John surgery uh it was you know what? It was it was Colin Poche, Yanni Chirinos, Jalen Beeks, Tyler Glass. Now after the uh, and he like specifically had uh, grievances with the with the league and the uh, the sticky stuff uh, ban and that he said that that had some sort of uh, something to do with it. Andrew Kittredge last year, Brandon McKay. Uh, it's it's an every year thing where we are talking about a series of raised pitchers that get these sixty day IL injuries. Uh, that have something to do with their elbow that have something to do with their arm. Uh, and yeah, it is an every single year type of thing. Really unfortunate for the Rays, And yeah, it's something that we've kind of gone into detail on this channel uh, and we have a YouTube short on it. We have something on our Instagram about it that like, yeah, this is, this is not every team is going through this. I know that pitcher injuries are increasing, but that is most notable 
with the Tampa Bay Rays. Uh, you know, I in the in the short we mentioned like that six at the time six of the 14 pitchers who had 125 plus innings since 2019 had Tommy John surgery and that no other AL East team had more than one such pitcher the the rest of the AL East had three had a uh, yeah four combined pitchers with Tommy John surgeries with that hit that, par, that hit those parameters well the Rays had six uh, alone by themselves not not among four teams um yeah and just like they've had Yes, since 2019, they've had nine pitchers go down with Tommy John surgery of note. Like, I don't even know if that this doesn't include like minor leaguers also who probably, you know, maybe have issues. But it's uh, Shane McClanahan, Tyler Glass now, Jeffrey Springs, Yanni Torinos, Shane Boz, Colin Poche, Andrew Kittredge, uh, Brendan McKay and Jalen Beeks. So, yeah, it's uh, it's just been it's just been like this for for whatever reason. And even now that we're you, we're now at a point with how well the Rays started off early in the season and how they've kind of fell back down to earth and even become kind of mediocre to this point over the last few month, months, all these injuries, you could say, are costing them a title. Because you look at their rotation right now, Zach Eflin, who, to his credit, has been very good recently, Tyler Glass now, who's back, uh, Aaron Savali, who they just traded for, and then Fangraphs has Zach Littell listed in their rotation. Zach Littell is not a starting pitcher. He never has been. Uh, like, and I mean, even when you look in the line of minor leagues, is Taj Bradley, like, is he still on the roster? Because he's not I think listed. he got sent down. He got sent down. That's unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he, he is in the minors right now. You're right. Um, yeah, I mean, like, the Rays, if you look at this offense, it still has been performing very well. Yandy Diaz uh, has been excellent. Brandy Rosarena, we know about. Isak Paredes has broken out this year. Uh, Jose Siri is having a very funny season. He's He has a, a weighted runs created bu- plus above 100 and also an OBP below 260. But uh, you look at up and down this offense, it's solid. You look at the bullpen, and it's not what it used to be, but it's still fine. The rotation is the problem and it's because every single guy that they anticipated having is hurt right right exactly and uh and yeah when when you look at the injured list of Rays starting pitchers it's a re it's like in it's a bunch of aces it's shane mcclanahan it's uh shane boz along with drew rasmussen and jeffrey springs who are all all doing pretty well at like the fact that, you know, they have all those guys in the organization, but they can't use any of them, you know, especially come playoff time. That's really alarming. And I think, uh, you know, the Ra- the Rays were kind of in the situation in 2021 where they had a good, a really good roster outside of the starting rotation and their starting rotation kind of cost them uh, at, you know, that year they won 100 games, uh, you know, were the first seed in the, in the American League, kind of the favorites to go to the World Series. But you know, unfortunately for them, their starting their starting rotation was it was McClanahan, who wasn't quite the McClanahan that he became eventually. Uh, then also, you know, Shane Boz uh, and Drew Rasmussen that were, you know, all like all rookies that were not like really necessarily prepared yet. And, you know, eventually they kind of faltered and, and let that series go in the in the ALDS. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean. You know, that that might have been their best chance at a title just by winning, you know, by win total throughout the year. And like they were probably favored in that series by the Reds against the Red Sox by a lot. But I think this year is the most talented roster they came into spring training with. And I think a lot of people would agree with that. You mentioned McClanahan wasn't, you know, the established guy that he is now. The rotation is is was much deeper. Uh, the offense was a lot deeper as well. Um and it really feels like even with how competitive the AL East is, you know, if they don't win the World Series this year, they might be losing out on their best chance of a title because of whatever whatever goes on uh, with the pitching staff with these injuries. Because I don't know, like this this feels like it just can't be a coincidence at this point. And it's felt that way for a while, but it just keeps happening. Yeah, yeah, we've been yeah, we've been on this since 2021. At least- yeah, since 2021 and like especially like April of this year when when Springs went down, we were like, yeah, this is this is not 
not every organization is going through this luckily yeah i mean the the rays can't really keep pace like no matter how many how many guys they develop how many guys they trade for how many guys they sign in free agency they're just not going to be able to keep up because if you have four really good starting pitchers on the on the injured list and you're a low budget ball club uh you're not really going to be able to keep up and and that's kind of as you say it's what's keeping them from potentially getting a title because they've done pretty much everything else organizationally pretty well except for this part which is keeping their starting pitchers healthy yeah i mean I, we've been talking about how you know come playoff time the you know the the, the takeaway that we've had was like you're going to want to be the sixth seed so you can play the twins at this point maybe you even want to be the team that plays the rays especially with the starting pitching that they're going to be putting out even if it's just a two-game series you know how much can you buy into tyler glass now and zach eflin you, know, you could but it's not you know i think a lot of teams will be able to match that or you know, have something better than that right now. Right, right. And, you know, I guess if you're going starting, if you're going just based off starting staff, also Sonny Gray and Pablo Lopez out of the, out of Minnesota have been mm -hmm. doing really well pretty much all season too. Yeah. Um, Orioles, I mean, it's, I mean, I guess there's not a ton behind Kyle Bradish, but, you know, that's a team that isn't most known for their starting pitching to begin with. Right, right. Um, yeah, it'll it'll be interesting to see how the rest of Tampa Bay's season plays out. Um, I should take a look at the standings because it doesn't seem like they're really close to falling out of the race, which is good for them. I mean, they they established themselves the first three months of the season as way out ahead of everybody else. So, you know, they are three and a half ahead of Seattle, who's the first team out of the playoffs. Um, or no, they're uh they're six above. Seattle uh right now the Astros are three and a half ahead of, of Seattle so the Rays are still in a comfortable spot but but yeah I mean once you get to the playoffs everybody's zero and zero and it's probably going to be a tougher situation for them yeah it's um, it's going to be interesting um and it is it just really sucks it's really unfortunate that uh this has happened yes absolutely absolutely um yeah and and Speaking of wild card races, uh, one that is much tighter and much weirder with weirder with weird teams and weird stuff going on is the National League wild card race, where as of this recording, there are three three teams tied for the third wild card spot, along with another team, the Diamondbacks. Uh, they are one game back of that spot. You got the Cubs, Marlins. Reds and Diamondbacks all fighting for the third wild card spot to potentially face most likely the Brewers at the end of the year unless something changes in the NL Central which definitely could happen. Uh what have you been thinking about the the really tight NL wild card race? I think this is such a fun race because you know when the, the when the when the league expanded the playoffs I think a lot of things that people were worrying about was like that the extra playoff spots would quote unquote like reward mediocrity you know they would allow for teams in the playoffs that just didn't deserve it and weren't good every one of these teams that are in the picture you know there's something that you could be excited about with a playoff run with them uh you know like obviously the phillies they went to the world series last year last year they're the four seed the giants have been overperforming this year uh they've looked excellent they'd be the five seed and the cubs have obviously been winning a lot of games lately uh and then you know, you look beyond that and it's the Reds who have been fun. The Marlins who have had, you know, Luis Arise, who's been interesting to watch. Uh, the Marlins, interestingly, have very uh, different numbers home and home and away. They're 10 games over 500 at, um, at home, six games under on the road. Um, hmm. Arizona, who I know that they've been awful lately and, you know, their record would suggest that they've been, you know, mediocre or whatever, but, you know, I mean, it's a team that was solid for the whole season and then they just completely crashed and burned for a month. Uh, and then San Diego, who, yes, they are 56 and 58 and 64, but they do have a, a run differential of plus 62. And I know that I'm not the biggest fan of run differential, but like when there's that drastic of a difference, like that does mean something. Yeah, you know, right, when, right, when right. They're, when they're playing ten games below their Pythagorean win loss in on August eighteenth, um, so every team here, you know, there is there is something interesting going on, no doubt. So I mean, it's a fun, 
it's a fun race and I'm excited. And also just, it is very close. Like the Padres are five games out, but it feels like they're more than capable of making a run at any point. And I know that we've been saying that the whole season and they just haven't, but you know, it still feels like it, they have it in them. Right. Yeah, uh, exactly. I think one team for me, that's really intrigued me and, and we haven't really talked about them, uh, but they have made a huge turnaround is the Chicago Cubs. Um, mm-hmm. They've won 19 of their last 27 for the second best record in baseball in that span. Uh, also in the span, they have scored the second most runs and second highest weighted runs created plus who would have thought weighted runs created plus and runs scored would have a, would have such a <laughs> correlation. Um, no but way. also they have uh, eight qualified hitters in the span and they all have at least a 106 weighted runs created plus. Um, so they're, they have eight qualified hitters who are all doing at least 6% above average. And they've got, I think, three guys that are doing at least 50% above average. Uh, Nico Horner's out there with like a 153 weighted runs created plus and nine stolen bases. Uh, yeah, like they had their, their offense is moving. Um, and also what should be noted with the Cubs is according to Tankathon, they have the fourth easiest strength of schedule remaining, which is the easiest schedule out of all these wildcard contenders. So yeah, I think there's, there's something, they got the momentum and they got the easy schedule. And the Cubs might not even be a wildcard contender because them and the Reds are both two games behind the Brewers in the NL central. Um, It's funny because the NL central, I mean, when you look at the quality of teams, the winning percentages, it's not that far off from the AL central. It is better, but um, you know, it it has the, you know, it has the fun of, uh, you know, two unexpected teams that are in the race that could win the division. Uh, Yes. The AL central has been a little more expected. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Like the, the Cubs were not really expected to be playoff contenders. The Reds, definitely not. We both had them uh, in the cellar and they continue to, you know, although, although they fell off a little bit, they continue to remain in that, in that wild card run. And also the Diamondback shout out to them. Like we, we talked about them last week, how bad they've been. Uh, they, they've recovered in a decent way. I mean, they won last night against the Padres. They won a series against the Rockies, which obviously you, you should do, but also yeah. that was the home Rockies. So you know, a little bit, a little bit tougher. The home um, Rockies are, to be honest, the home Rockies still aren't even good this year. They're 26 and 32. It's just, you know, the road Rockies are 20 and 43. Yeah. Right. 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 <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the, every, as you said, every team is intriguing for different, for different reasons. Cubs, I think largely because their offense and also their momentum and the story of this turn, the turnaround of this team, uh, and also we we know how fun you know Chicago can be around playoff time if they do indeed have maybe a home playoff game at some point. Uh, Marlins have some fun pitching, like seeing Sandy Al- Sandy Alcantara, who has kind of turned his season around. Seeing him in a playoff game would be very very cool. Uh, like a real backs- playoff game that's not 2020. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Like you know. And, uh, a playoff game with a playoff environment uh the reds i mean with how much young talent they have that would be a good story seeing ellie de la cruz as a rookie uh in the playoffs along with guys like steer and mclean uh along with joey Votto getting a getting another shot in the postseason that would be fun and then yeah the diamondbacks uh with corbin carroll leading the way and you know christian walker there a lot of a lot of young talent i think there's a lot of a lot of teams you'd you'd have fun with just seeing in the playoffs yeah no doubt no doubt um yeah the amount of parity that we've seen this year in the league has been a lot of fun you know I mean I'm very I'm very excited but also dreading looking back and seeing how many of the division winners you and I correctly predicted there's a there's a non-zero chance I'm actually there's probably a decent chance I'm gonna go over six yeah which is wild yeah but I don't, that's that's a sign of a good season i think yeah you know it's a sign of a lot of fun no doubt because i had i had what toronto they're probably not going to win it i had cleveland they could um i had houston they absolutely still could uh i had the mets i had the cardinals and i had the padres yeah yeah or did i have the no i think i i did have the cardinals yeah you had the padre or, or yeah you had the cardinals um yeah, I'm the only thing saving me in that regard is I picked the Braves, but yeah, everything well, else that's... for everything else for me doesn't look good. Cause I 
I also picked the White Sox for AL Central, which yeah, which is the worst pick maybe of the season for st- at least standings wise. I mean, my Mets pick is pretty tough too. It it can yeah, it could it like can they tough. are they could get passed by the Nationals. That's true. That's true. Nationals are hot, by the way. I was looking. Yeah, at, I was looking at the Cubs. Yeah, not to get off track here, but I was looking at the Cubs like uh, run and how they had the second best record in baseball. But if you advance a day, the Nationals have won 17 of the last 26, which is pretty wild. Mm-hmm. It's like tied for the fourth best record in baseball. So, yeah, shout out to the Nationals. Caber, yeah, Cabert's doing well. Um, I think uh, Lane Thomas has been doing well. Pitching yeah. staff looks better between like Matt Gore and Josiah Gray, I think. Right, right. Yeah. So I mean, let me see yeah. if Josiah Gray's been. I got, yeah, I got no, I mean, guys. it is very cool that the Nationals look at least like they could be a team that has to be on our radars next year. Right. Yeah. Not automatic last place, which is, which is pretty cool. Chad um, Angler's legend, Josiah Gray, by the way. Uh, yep. Yeah, right, right, right. Um, all right, since so yeah, his mean, last three starts haven't been great. And uh yeah, I think part and what also fascinated me about the Cubs, not to go not to dive right back into them, but you know, in the span where they've won 19 out of 27, they've really kind of leapfrogged the rest of the pack in this race because the best the the best team in this race outside of them in the in this uh, 27 game span was is the reds who are still below 500 in the span they were 13 and 14 reds were 13 and 14 the uh marlins were 10 and 16 and diamondbacks were 10 and 18 so the cubs have taken advantage of some teams sort of performing mediocre or poorly yeah but they've but they've gone in and done what they need to do that's the important part Exactly. Exactly. You can't control you can't control the other teams on your schedule and how good or bad they are, but what you can control is you know how you handle those. Yeah, and that that's why they really intrigued me for this playoff spot because they have the momentum and they also have uh, a fairly easy schedule ahead according to um according to the numbers. Uh all right, anything more before we get into players to highlight? Uh no, honestly that was kind of it. Yeah. All right. So now we will get into our Friday, August 18th, 2023 edition of How About That? He's striking out less, walking more, and he's also making better contact. Turning into a strikeout machine just out of nowhere. He's been excellent all around this year. He is getting a How About That? So my How About That for today, uh, I'm looking at a team that, you know, let's be honest, they haven't had a lot to cheer for uh, this year. Uh, I'm talking about Zach Jeloff of the Oakland Athletics, uh, who has been really fascinating lately. You know, he's been a top prospect for the A's that's come up and has produced for them. And I think that's something that the A's fans have kind of been waiting for since last year. You know, Shea Langoliers had moments, but we haven't really seen it from him this year. Um, You know, same with like Tyler Soderstrom, but you know, Zach Jeloff has looked legitimate this year in his 28 games played. Uh, since his big league career began on July 14th, uh, he is slashing 294, 353, 633 for a 986 OPS and a 170 weighted runs created plus. That 170 weighted runs created plus and his 1.5 fan graphs wins above replacement both rank 16th among all position players since July 14th. So he's been a top 20 player, position player since that day. Uh, in his 28 games, he has a 40.1% hard hit rate and a 42.1% sweet spot rate, which the hard hit rate is above average, but the sweet spot rate is elite. Uh, 25% of his hard hit balls have been hard hit and in the sweet spot. And that is tied for the 26th highest rate among the 231 hitters with at least 50 batted balls in this span. Uh, and also in this span, 60, 67.1% of his batted balls have been either fly balls or line drives. And that is tied for the third highest rate on that same list. Uh, again, two thirds of his batted balls, he's not getting on the ground. He's not hitting way up in the air, and he has a high exit velocity on them. I believe his average exit velocity on fly balls and line drives is 93 miles per hour, which is above the average. Uh, he has 20 extra base hits, 
between his 11 doubles, one triple, and eight home runs. And he is the second player in Oakland slash Kansas City slash Philadelphia slash potentially Vegas A's history to have, uh, what was it, 20 extra base hits in their first 28 career games. The only other player to do so was Nap Lejoie in 1901, as far back as game logs can possibly go. And throughout his career so far, he is hitting 500 and slugging 2,000 against 47 batted balls on fastballs, whether it be four seamers, sinkers, or cutters. He has a 6.7 run value against fastballs in this span, and that is tied for the 11th most in the majors. So Zach Jeloff uh, has been making an immediate impact on all facets of the game for the Oakland A's. Yeah, uh, Zach Jeloff. How about that? Um, yeah, he's been he's been popping off. You know, really good to see for A's fans uh, who are s- going to stick around. I mean, potentially, I don't know. But yeah. nonetheless, I mean, if you're going to A's games, it's nice to see this ki- this guy killing it, this rookie killing it. Um, mm-hmm. And my how about that is another rookie, uh, this guy out of Cleveland. Uh, talking about Tanner Bybee, who uh, has really established himself as a solid starting pitcher so far in his very, very young career. Uh, in his last nine starts, Tanner Bybee has a 1.79 ERA and 3.30 FIP in 55 and a third innings pitched. And out of 75 qualifiers in the span, he leads in ERA uh, over almost two month span. Uh, out of 70 pitchers with 750 plus pitches thrown in the span, Tanner Bybee's expected batting average ranks ninth, his expected slugging ranks sixth, and expected Woba against ranks seventh. His average exit, a lot of this has had to do with his uh, allowing a lot softer contact as his average exit velocity has gone from 90.0 miles per hour before the span to 87.1 miles per hour in the span. Uh, and out of 70 pitchers, his average exit velocity against ranks 11th. Uh, along with that, he is allowing batted balls at more optimal optimal launch angles his sweet spot rate has gone from 39 percent to 33 percent and his barrel rate has gone from 8.3 percent to 2.0 percent only one out of 50 batted balls that tanner bobby has allowed in in his last nine starts have been barrels which is pretty uh pretty great that's what you want to avoid is is barrels and out of 119 pitchers with 100 plus batted balls against in the span, Tanner Bybee Tanner, Tanner Bybee's barrel rate against is the lowest out of 119. Along with that, he has an 89% left on base rate in the span, which is the fourth highest in baseball and that is partly because he has a 38% strikeout rate with runners in scoring position. And out of 81 pitchers with 40 plus batters faced uh with runners in scoring position, Bybee's strikeout rate ranks second. So Tanner Bybee, he is allowing uh, far softer contact. He's only allowed three barrels uh, in his last nine starts, which is great for avoiding home runs and extra base hits. Uh, And he is also striking out a lot of batters when it matters most, when runners are in scoring position, which puts him at an 89% left on base rate. Um, All right, so Tanner Bybee. How about that? Yeah, and shout out to a uh, guy that I got to watch pitch in person earlier this year, Tanner Bybee. Nice, nice, good stuff. Uh, unfortunately, that did not happen during the span. It would have been, it would have been cool. No, if we had it, that, I checked. It was 14, 14 starts ago. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure we have at some point seen a guy in a span that we've covered in a how about that. Yeah, I well particularly I yeah I, I I watched um. I put Kike Hernandez as a how about that in 2021, and I I'd seen him a couple times in that in that. Actually, span, we I probably think. we probably both saw him in that span because it probably included that game yep. against the Royals where he homered. Yep, yep, it it did, it did. Yeah. All right, so now we move on from the highs to the lows, where we're talking players and subjects that have been underperforming for our Friday, August 18, 2023 edition of slightly alarming statistics. He's been barreling up the ball way less. He's not missing bats. He's not getting the ball on the ground, and people are hitting it in the air more. It's been so bad. He is getting a... Slightly alarming. Yeah, so for my slightly alarming today, this guy may not have had the highest expectations coming into the year, but I don't think we expected 
what we've seen. And this is definitely a more sad, how about, or sad, slightly alarming. Uh, I'm going with Adam Wainwright on this one. Uh, mm. You know, he is in the final year of his career and this is just quite simply not been a year to remember for him uh, in 16 starts. He has an 8.42 ERA and a 6.05 FIP. Uh, he is first percentile in expected ERA slash expected Woba, expected batting average, expected, expected slugging, strikeout rate, whiff rate, and fastball velocity. Um, in 2021, he had a run value of 6.4 on his sinker, according to the StatCast search, which it ha- formulates it differently than the main page. Uh, but anyway, his 6.4% run value on his sinker was uh, the 16th most by a pitcher in any season since 2008. And in 2023, it's down to minus 8.5, which is tied for the 148th lowest on the total list of 7,033 total seasons. Uh, so that is a dramatic drop off. Uh, on the main page, it's gone from 15 in 2022 or 2021 to negative 22 this year. Um, the negative 2020, the negative 22 run value on his sinker is the lowest of any pitch throughout the major leagues this year out of 2,192. And it's that bad because on 120 plate appearances ending on sinkers, opponents are hitting 413, slugging 789, and they have a 525 Woba. And at a Wainwright sinker has a launch angle of 11 degrees and a ground ball rate of 40%. That is the 11th lowest among 129 pitchers with at least 50 batted balls against on their sinker. Uh, and you throw sinkers to induce ground balls. That's the entire purpose of why you do them. Uh, Adam Wainwright is not doing that. So essentially, he's just throwing a straight fastball with no velocity that doesn't move. That's essentially what his sinker has been this year. His movement, both vertical and horizontal, have been below the league average this year. So uh, there's no real use of throwing it. And oh, by the way, uh, he's throwing his sinker at the highest rate since 2012 this year, uh, which, you know, I couldn't really tell you why. But at the same time, of the six pitches that he's thrown this year, uh, opponents are hitting 300 and slugging 500 against all of them. Uh, That includes his curveball that he's made his career off of. It includes everything that he's thrown. Uh, My the, the thing with Adam Wainwright, you might wonder. Like, why is he even still going at this point? Like, I get it's his last year. The Cardinals are out of the race. But, like, this is just sad to watch. Well, he does need two more wins to get to 200 for his career. He's sitting at 198 career wins. And getting to 200 would mean something. Uh, so here's my my proposition. If you're the Cardinals, you just got to take him out of the rotation, put him in the bullpen, pick two games this year where the Cardinals score a lot of runs early, let him get the let him get the last out of the fifth inning, and go from there. Yeah, why not? That, why not? Like as long as there isn't like you know some young pitcher on the mound that you want to see something from, pick a game, put him in to get the get that last out of the fifth. Do it twice, just get him there. Like don't don't make him get on the mound every day thinking like all right I got to do it today I have to do it. Like just right. make it as easy as possible. Get the monkey off his back. Um, but yeah. Adam Wainwright, it's been very unfortunate to watch. Yep, Adam Wainwright. Slightly alarming. Um, yeah, unfortunate, unfortunate, but, but it almost makes you feel better knowing that the Cardinals aren't competing this year because, you know, he would have been out, out of the rotation a long time ago um, and not really able to. Yeah, I, I don't know how many innings he would just be getting in general if the Cardinals were competing right now. Um. Mm-hmm. My slightly alarming uh, is coming out of Miami. Another pitcher, uh, definitely far younger, uh, Jesus Lazardo. Um, and this is kind of this is a bit of a small sample size, but it's been pretty extreme. Uh, Jesus Lazardo, he he had a three three two ERA and a lower FIP last year. And he was doing pretty well this year up until his last four starts, uh, where in his last four starts he has allowed twenty earned runs and eight home runs. Uh, for a 10.59 ERA and 909 FIP in 17 innings pitch. And out of 77 qualifiers in the span, his ERA, FIP, and home runs per nine are all the highest. And out of 110 pitchers with 250 plus pitches thrown in the span, Jesus Lazardo's expected batting average against is second highest, and his expected slugging and expected WOBA against are both the highest out of 110. 
Uh, his strikeout rate has gone from 29% before the span to 18% in this span. Uh, and this largely has to do with him not putting guys away. Uh, his whiff rate with two strikes has gone from 31% to 22%. But the largest problem of all with Hazel Cesardo has been his batted balls against. Uh, and obviously with the strikeout rate going down, there are more batted balls against him, or at least a higher rate of batted balls against him. Uh, his average exit velocity against has gone from 89.1 miles per hour to 91.7 miles per hour. Uh, along with along with that, out of 68 pitchers with 50 plus batted balls in the span, his average exit velocity against is 10th highest. Uh, and he's along with allowing uh, harder contact, he's also allowing yeah, like worse forms of contact. His fly ball rate has gone from 27% to 33%. Uh, one third of the time batters are hitting fly balls against him, not necessarily pop-ups, but fly balls. Uh, league average is around 25%. And Jesus Lazardo's barrel rate has also gone from an already alarming 10% up to 14% in the span. And out of 68 pitchers, that barrel rate is third highest, uh, which explains the amount of home runs he's been giving up. And he has thrown, uh, Jesus Lazardo has thrown four pitch, four different pitches at least 4% of the time. And the lowest average on one of those pitches is 325 and the lowest slugging on one of those pitches is 700. So the best pitch, the lowest uh, slugging is 700. Yes. The, Holy the cow. his best pitch uh, of the pitches that he's throwing at least 4% of the time uh, is still, still has a 700 slugging against it. Um, yeah. So it's been, it's been really bad. The last four starts, he was having a really good year up to this point and kind of like, um, kind of like establishing himself as a potential top of the rotation guy, but a rough stretch. And let's, let's hope it doesn't last for long. Also, by the way, uh, this is a talk of shame. I did highlight him as a player to watch this year. Mm -hmm. So, uh, unfortunate there, his Jesus Lazardo slightly alarming. So that shall do it Four players to highlight. We will get into a preview of the weekend ahead. Uh, we got a lot of series starting tonight. I will be getting into the series to watch Daniel will be getting into the day by day pitching matchups. Uh, as far as series go, I think a, a fun one between two teams uh, competing in, in their respective wild card races is uh, the Reds are hosting the Blue Jays <clears throat> at Great American Ballpark for a three game set. Uh, we also have uh, Rangers Brewers who are both competing for their respective div divisions that will be at Globe Life. Uh, yeah, Globe Life Field, Field or Park? Is it Globe, Globe Life Field? Uh, it's Globe Life Field. Yeah, I always get that. Maybe mixed it up. is Park. I think. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but yeah, the Rangers are hosting the Brewers. Uh, both competing in their respective division yeah, races, so Field. it's it's going to be a fun, uh, a fun matchup nonetheless. Uh, and along with that, we have. Uh, I think the premier series to watch is at Minute Maid Park. I think it's always fun when these two teams match up, especially with how one of these teams has been performing lately. Uh, it's the Astros and the Mariners. Uh, that will be a fun matchup at Minute Maid, both competing for playoff spots, and Astros are definitely competing for the division. If the, Mar if the Mariners do well enough, they might be competing for the division as well. Um, so what do you have for the day-by-day -day pitching matchups? So on Friday tonight, as we're recording this, Tarek Skubal and Gavin Williams will face each other in Tigers Guardians. That's in Cleveland. That'll be a fun one because both of them are really good young pitchers. Jose Barrios will be facing the Reds uh, for the Blue Jays in Cincinnati. Michael Lorenzen will be facing the Nationals again, this time at Nats Park. Uh, last time he faced the Nationals, he threw a no-hitter. So he'll be doing that again for the Phillies. Uh Brian Bale will be facing the Yankees tonight at Yankee Stadium for the Red Sox. The Yankees have yet to announce their starter. Uh, Brandon Woodruff and Andrew Heaney will face each other in Brewers Rangers in the series that Chris just highlighted. Bryce Miller and JP France, a couple of young guys that have made an impact for their teams, will be going in the Mariners Astros. Pablo Lopez will be going for the Pirates or for the Twins against the Pirates, excuse me, in Minnesota. Um, Tyler Anderson will go for the Angels against the Rays. Uh, Kyle Gibson will be going for the A's 
against the A's for the Orioles. That's in Oakland. Uh, Sandy Alcantara and Tony Gonsolin will face each other in Marlins Dodgers. And matchup of the night comes from Giants Braves in Atlanta. It's Alex Cobb versus Spencer Strider. Yeah, it's quite the quite the matchup of styles. You got the strikeout yep. machine versus the ground ball machine. Exactly. Then on Saturday, you have Cutter Crawford versus Garrett Cole in Red Sox Yankees in Yankee Stadium. Uh, you have Freddie Peralta and Dane Dunning going against each other in Brewers Rangers. Chris Bassett will be going for the Red for the Blue Jays against the Reds. Eduardo Rodriguez and your how about that Tanner Bybee will go against each other in Tigers Guardians. Uh, Logan Gilbert and Framber Valdez will face each other in, I believe, a game one uh, of the ALDS rematch in Houston. That was the same matchup. Uh, Mitch Keller and Sonny Gray will face each other in Pirates Twins. Kodai Senga will be facing the Cardinals for the Mets in St. Louis. Logan Webb will be facing the Braves for the Giants. Uh, Merrill Kelly and Hugh Darvish will face each other in Diamondbacks Padres in San Diego. Uh, you will have Zach Eflin facing the Angels for the Rays. Yuri Perez and uh, Julio Orias facing each other in Marlins Dodgers at Dodger Stadium. And matchup of the afternoon comes from Royals Cubs. It is Brady Singer versus Justin Steele. I don't know if mm. you've seen Brady Singer's stats over his last five starts, but I promise that's why. That's why I'm putting that. So then yeah. on Sunday to finish out the weekend, uh, you have a couple of young guys going in Mariners Astros. Emerson Hancock versus Hunter Brown. Max Fried will be going for the Braves against the Giants. Uh, you will have Hyunjin Ryu and Hunter Green making his return from the IL in Blue Jays and Reds. Uh, you will have... Uh, let's see. We will have Max Serger going for the Rangers against the Brewers. Dylan Cease going for the White Sox against the Rockies in Colorado. Kyle Bradish going for the Orioles against the A's. Uh, you will have Michael Waka going for the Padres against the Diamondbacks in San Diego. Braxton Garrett and Bobby Miller, a couple of young guys going in Marlins Dodgers. And a matchup of the afternoon comes from Rays Angels in Angel Stadium. It's Tyler Glasnow versus Patrick Sandoval. Yeah, that is a solid matchup between two guys who definitely get their they get their strikes they get their strikeouts in, um, and yeah, that shall do it for this installment of Above Replacement Radio. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this one. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify and want to check out our digital content, want to watch the conversation as it happens, go to the YouTube channel and subscribe to the YouTube channel. It is called Above Replacement Radio. And also check out the shorts and the playlists, including the baseball history series and our guest interviews, most recently with Mike Petriello. And uh, if you want to follow us on social media, follow me on Twitter at Chris underscore Gianta. Follow Daniel on both Twitter and Instagram at Daniel underscore Current. And follow the show Instagram at Above Replacement Radio for all the show needs. We hope you enjoyed this one and we hope to see you next time where we are talking all the happenings in Major League Baseball once again. See you then. This conversation. This conversation is over. Is over.